She came to the well, y'all, every day. Got to talking to my Jesus. She didn't know her life was about to change. She said, I come to this well every day, and my feet are getting mighty tired. Jesus said, don't you worry, give you water from the well that'll never run dry. She got to jumping, feeling mighty happy. She just couldn't hold a piece yet. She went to town telling the people all around. She put the word out on the street. She said, come see the man with the master plan. Just the Savior I have found. Oh, blessed Jesus. I tell you that I've seen him and he turned my life around. And she cried. Oh, I got to tell somebody. Oh, Jesus is the king of my life. Oh, I got to show somebody. some handouts to give everybody some handouts we want to be look want to be looking at the book of John and we are scheduled to be doing that for the next uh, 12 to 13 weeks um, the handout you're getting will give you a schedule of how we want to approach it it is rather am ambitious mm -hmm. because we are looking at having doing two chapters each session so it means that we will have to get right into it. We'll have to start asking the questions. We'll have to start you know, pushing ahead with it. Um, <coughs> so I'm going to just run down a couple of questions that we want to put out there at the beginning. One is, why are we studying John at this time? Why? 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 Why we want to look at John, just three simple points. There are many other reasons we could be, but asking you to bear in mind that first is that we want to have a better understanding of the book of John. The other point, two of three, is how is John different from the other Gospels? And the one we want to spend most of our time on is identifying and appreciating how John demonstrates that Jesus is the Son of God. Why is that so the, the larger portion of our study? Because John gives us that as his mission when we read John chapter 20. So John chapter 20, 30 and 31, if you read it, different versions have it different ways, but my Bible says, Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. John says, but these, this writing, this record is written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. The purpose of John's writing is that you may believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. That is what John tells us is the purpose of his writing. 
And that is why as we go through this book, we're going to be going through it, seeing if we can identify how does John bring that message across that Jesus is the Son of God and that it aids us in believing that he is. Now, we want to search for the evidence John has left for us and um, how we identify Jesus as the Son of God. A key part of our obedience and coming to Christ when we, before we get in that water, if we are falling, as we all have done, is that the question is asked of you, do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? I'm looking to see if any face, if it looks strange to anybody. Because that is a question we all were asked. We had to consider, we had to go down that narrow road ourselves and decide, do I believe this thing? So, so key an element in our conversion, in our obedience to Jesus Christ. Let us, so it will be a revision for some of us. It will be a reaffirming, a searching, and a coming to be more comfortable with the idea of do I really believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? Believing that will build our foundation, our confidence in sharing this information with others. Because when you walk out there, especially in the world we live in today, but I guess it has always been, I mean, every account of the gospel tells us, um, we hear that there will be scoffers in the last days, the Bible tells us, it's not a new phenomenon. Mm -hmm. Why is it that you get up, you drive your gas, you come to this place, you, you spend your hours here, you spend your time trying to live up to a moral code? Because you believe in this thing. Now, we want to discuss this. Is this ritual? Is this tradition? Is this what I've learned? Or do I, Matthew Blake, believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? If we are so convinced, then we can better be able to understand and work with this information in our daily life. I have shared, I have written here four expectations that I want to share with you. One, participate. Participate, participate, participate. Yes, we want to learn from you. All of us have a lot of information that we have gathered from Bible studies over the years, from reading, just from information about the Bible. We want to cross-fertilize that. So participate and start early. Don't wait until we are 40 minutes in. And then Brother Davis looks at me and says, mm, start early. Let's, let's get it out there. Read or listen to the chapters, however you get your information through the Bible. Share the knowledge from past studies. And the comments, we wanna, I want to ask special favor and begging. If you have long questions, break them up. Yes. Ask that pointed one, ask that pointed one, and let's keep it going, all right? One of the questions I ask myself is, how will I know if, if I have learned anything? And I write here that as we study the book, let's make a plan before we even start. Plan that at the end, and I am putting down here, at least three examples that you can share. If we live all together at the end of March, you must have at least three things that you can share confidently as to why you think you have a better understanding of the book. Why is John account different? How has John made you sure that Jesus is the Son of God? And I'm feeling that if we can conscientiously do that, then I'll know if, yes, I did gain some knowledge, or no, I just reaffirmed some things. But there's a sense of how was the time invested? And so, you should have a schedule looking something like this. And you will see how the chapters are listed out. Um, there are two blank weeks at the end. They are left empty intentionally because I'm sure we will have times when we'll need a little overlapping. Sometimes we might run a week over or so. So they are left there intentionally. All right. So any questions so far? 
or as one lecturer used to say, any additions, deletions, consultations, confirmations, and all sorts of Asians that might come to you. Not the nation, but just the Asians. Yes? I have just a question for, of clarification reading this. So <coughs> week two is chapters two and three. I'm going all the way across. Is two and three, right? yes. Okay, yes, fine. yes, yes. Thank yes. you. Yes. All right. Okay. So with that said, uh, we're going to jump right in here and we're going to start. Now they're not going to, I haven't planned it with a lot of slides because it's meant for us to have some discussions going. Mm -hmm. All right, so just to, I'm figuring many of us would know a lot of this information. But to begin, that John the Apostle is credited with writing the book of John but he's accredited writing some four books of the New Testament. So you would have John, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, and the book of Revelation. Okay. Now, I want to pause here to say that depending on the school that you're in, you're going to hear different arguments as to is it the Apostle John who wrote John? Was it somebody afterwards? And you're going to find that almost with, with a lot of the books of the Bible. I'm going to ask us that we can get into that, but I'm going to ask that we focus more on the substance of the gospel for this study rather than getting into the form. Amen. All right, we can, discussing, having those discussions, not a problem. Why? So many records are out there about the discussions around the authorship of many of these books. So we're not going to go into that kind of side. We're going to go with the book with the view searching the information in the book. That's what we're focusing on. So, most of our information about John comes from the Gospels. We do have some information from historians and from the church fathers, as they're called, but a lot of the information we have is from the Gospels. John was part of the inner circle of Christ, considered one of the pillars of the church. So, Whenever we hear John call, it's usually Peter, James, and John. Mm -hmm. And so John wrote uh, about AD 85 to 90. And so what we have is that John would have written some, if we do the maths right, AD 33. You add another how much to get 85. Whatever that number comes up, it gives you that gap of years when John wrote. So Christianity would have started some, let's say 40 and 40, 80, so that's 47, somewhere about 50 years. 50 years. So John would have been writing to Christians and, of course, um, Jews, a mixed audience at that point. One of the things I want to say is that while there we have quite a few Johns in the Bible, but John, this writer is identified as the brother of James, the one whom the Lord loves. So then that's John 13, verse 23, 25, 21, 20 to 25. When we talk about John being, well, John also is, is, is identified. Jesus Christ calls James and John the sons of thunder, Mark 3, verse 17. Uh, we know that they were children of Galilean folks, fisher folk Zebedee and his wife Salome. We also know that it is possible that the mother of James and John may also have been the sister of Mary, the mother of Jesus. That would make them what? Cousins of Jesus and relatives too of John the Baptist. So John is, I'm trying to tell us who John is so that when we start to listen to John, we, dis we, we will know that John has the enough information to tell us what he's telling us in the book. All right. Um, we have 
John is come when Jesus is on the cross, he commends his mother to John. Woman, behold thy son. We all remember that. I'm looking. Okay. And we would know that by culture, as the first child, the first male, it is a responsibility to look after the family. Mm -hmm. And so he commends that to John. Interesting that Jesus had brothers, but um, he bestowed that responsibility to John, a believer. Um, there are ways we could look at that, extend that, that there are, there it, it is, it, it, it is more comforting knowing that your most precious possessions, you can leave them to someone who is a believer in Christ. There are some things you know will not happen. You will not expect to have dishonesty. You know, you can, you can have that person oversee your property. A true believer in Christ is not going to swindle you. Mm. And of course, if you're leaving your possessions, your, your hard-earned possessions, and in particular, your mother, then you want to know that, hey, the person I'm leaving in charge to look after my estate, my mother especially, I can rely, I can trust on that because that person's life is hid in Christ. And so there are some things you are not worried about. Uh, Paul in Galatians um, says to us that John, Galatians 2.9, one of the pillars of the church. And this is the, not the pillow, but the <laughs> pillar. <laughs> rest on, weight bearing, a dependable object. Some of us are sitting comfortably on the chairs. None of us checked when we came in. Is it looking? Will it hold me up? We trust the pillars are the support to hold us up. Well, John, the pillar of the church that the church can trust in, rely on, depend on, John is seen as one of them. Galatians 2 9. Like we say, he and James and John, he and James and Peter form the inner circle. When you think about things like Jesus Christ had the raising of Jairus' daughter, just some examples. In a circle with him was Peter, James, and John. So if you look at Mark 5, 37, Luke 8, 5, 1, Matthew 9, 23, okay. Then you find that, yes, John, Peter, James, and John. The Mount of Transfiguration. I mean, I'm going to be honest with you. I am feeling that if I was on that mountain, I wouldn't be recorded in the Gospels because I'd be running. <laughs> 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 But that's, that's me. Um, but that is to see Christ transfigured before you. Again, Peter, James, and John. And the Mount of Olives, the prophecy about the last days. These are the folks who are asking the question, Lord, what will happen in the last days? Peter, James, and John. And the one that would really have me Thinking in the Garden of Gethsemane, Christ goes off to pray, his sweat becomes as drops of blood. Who he leaves? Peter, James, and John. They all follow him, but he asks the rest to hold on. And he moves with his inner circle further. Peter, James, and John. So John has, I think, the information, the authority to speak to us about what he's telling us in the book. You might want to check that John says in the beginning of the book, we're going to look at it, that two of John the Baptist's apostles, or disciples, were walking, and when John the Baptist says, Behold the Lamb of God. One of them we know is Andrew. Simon Peter's brother. Could the other one be John? Something to think about. Because if it is John, it will put John at the very earliest point of the ministry of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Something to think about. So, 
John, for me, looking at some of these tells me that I would like to hear John's account. I would like to hear why is it, John, that you are telling me this? Why do you feel you need to tell us that, hey, Jesus Christ is God? Luke, for example, describes Jesus more for his humanitarian side. John spends his time telling us about the deity of Jesus Christ. Jesus is God. So we're going to go through the book, we're going to look at it, and we're going to see, can we see these things coming out, and how, do, how is it that it applies to us? Another thing, as I read the book of John now, is that John is markedly different. No parables. Isn't that interesting? And two miracles, only two miracles that John has that is recorded in the other Gospels, the feeding of the 5,000 near Bethsaida, and of course, the subsequent to that, Jesus walking on water to the apostles on the sea. But the water, changing water into wine at Cana, only in John. Healing of the royal official son in Capernaum, John. Healing of the paralytic at Bethsaida, John. So, why is it that John don't have, oh, we have two more, because there are supposed to be seven. Um, yep, I know. Healing of the man blind from birth, John chapter 9, raising of Lazarus. That one knocked me because I'm saying something as big as the raising of Lazarus, certainly. Would have all had all the other writers writing about that. But no, just John. Some other points, and these, these three points are listed on your the handout that you have. Um, but just to bear in mind that, hey, we want to see that John says Jesus is the word. Jesus has the word. And this is looking at the relationship between the Father and Christ. The ministry of John the Baptist, the forerunner of Christ. And it is interesting that John... Luke is the one who tends to write a more orderly account. But John says, I need to give you from the very beginning. And John takes us all the way to John chapter 19 when Jesus Christ says, it is finished. We get the full scope of it. So, John tells us that. And of course, we begin to see Jesus' ministry beginning with the calling of the first disciples. I wondered, when I read this, I said, why is it that the Bible is telling us that these gentlemen are from Bethsaida? And um, I guess something that has stuck with me from studying, doing accounting, is that none of the information you get is just there. It's telling you something. And so I looked in it, and Bethsaida is one of the towns that Christ said, woe unto if the gospel which I had preached to you was preaching Tyre and Sidon, they would have been converted. And I'm saying the first set, three of them at least, are from that place that Jesus Christ was saying, you guys are so slow to working with the gospel, so unappreciative of the gospel message, that if it was preached elsewhere, those folks, Tyre and Sidon, they would have been converted. The minds were not quickly receptive. But out of that environment, we have Andrew. We have Philip. We have Peter coming from that environment. It, it, it ought to say to us that, hey, Jesus Christ can reach us, can reach people wherever, however the situation looks. We want to be careful we want to be careful not to write people off. Amen. Not to think, you know, I have spoken to my son so many times. That's me, personally. But we have spoken to relatives, friends, people. I mean, these people don't need to hear the gospel anymore. Right. No, it, it appears that God is telling us, your job is to do what? Go teach. And you will teach until you die. Change your strategy, change your style. To wear different clothes, talk with a different accent if you have to, but keep going, keep going, because guess what? 
Woe unto you, Bethsaida. But, and we're going to look at the character of people like Andrew and Peter and say, these guys are from Bethsaida. Like Nathaniel says, can anything good come out of it? No. We want to check that, okay? All right, so with that said, let's dive in. Let's dive in. And there are not going to be a lot of slides. As a matter of fact, this is our last slide, is it? Yes, it is. So we're going to work with this slide as we go along. So John says, in the beginning, remember now, don't, leave, don't allow the star to leave us. Our purpose for studying is can we identify, can we identify why John says, Jesus is the Son of God. I'm asking us to seriously just pause, maybe now, maybe later, and say, do I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? I mean, don't just roll it off your tongue. Do I truly believe? Because, you see, in us saying that I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, automatically there is a lot of other things which follow that affirmation. Because, let's, let's take a simple one. If I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, then I have no choice but to tell people about Jesus Christ. It, it, you, 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 you don't get the option <coughs> to say, I'll do it today, but I won't do it tomorrow. You don't get the option to say, I am tired, I can't do it now. You don't get the option to say, I'm at the supermarket, the bag is heavy, let me not talk with this lady, this gentleman. You don't get the option. Mm -hmm. If you say, if you say, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, it comes with consequences. Okay. Um, let's pause for a moment, look at our friend Peter. He's in the judgment hall. And they say, surely you are one of them. No. Your speech betrays you. You were one of them. No. I have seen you with him. Listen, man. I say. It's not just saying, oh, I believe. It can't be just saying. So let's, let's, let's roll through the book of John and keep that in our forefront. So John says, in the beginning was the word. And the word was God. Let's pause and take that in. In the beginning was the word, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. I want to ask immediately, is there a passage that comes to mind? In the beginning, so it says, the word was with God, and the word was God. In the beginning. Before it all, when it started, Genesis chapter 1, verse, in the beginning, God. In the beginning, God. So, John, are you saying that Jesus Christ was in the beginning? Because, let's not take that lightly. If Jesus Christ was in the beginning, then is that discussion which says, let us, involving Jesus Christ. So, so all that we have, we experience, we are planning to enjoy, is because Jesus Christ was a part of that decision to create. So we understand then that the creator is and always will be greater than the creation. Do we worship the creator or the creation? We need to 
think a little about that. Because again, we're balancing with the fact that and the word was God. John is saying to us that that discussion to create Jesus Christ was a part of that. I don't know if we need to do any discussions about the Godhead, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. I'm watching the faces to see if anybody looks surprised or you know, there's any gap in the knowledge. But everybody seems to be looking comfortable with that, that, hey, we're good with that. Yeah. Good with that. Okay. So, let's see if we can understand John. So, John says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God. I'm giving you. Let's bring in Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12. And so Hebrew says the word is powerful, is quick, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing as part of soul, spirit, joint, marrow, and a discern of thoughts and intents of the heart. The word, Jesus Christ. Is, able, is in the beginning and is able to do all that. Do we see deity coming out in this kind of discussion? <coughs> do we see ideas and thought external to human limitations coming out? How many of us knows what the next person is thinking? I mean, we have persons trained in <coughs> mind science, but the person to determine truthfully what is the next person thinking? Not none of us. None of us. But the word Jesus Christ was in the beginning, proving to be God, <laughs> is able to do that. John is saying, let me tell you up front, let us begin by understanding some basics. In the beginning, God. In the beginning, God. It is this God that we're talking about. I'm sharing with you the all-powerful God. Listed here as the Logos or the Word. That, hey, this God is all-powerful. And was there in the beginning. And if we contrast the Genesis account, then we know that the, 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 the decision to create involved Jesus Christ. Let's tie in. Colossians 1, 17 into that. Colossians will tell us that nothing, everything that was made, was made by who? By Christ. Is that what your Bible says? So, we're tying it together. We are looking at Evidence to support Jesus as the Son of God. So therefore, what we have is Jesus Christ, creator of all. Is it then any challenge to us to worship God? Because it is, if we're understanding the Bible, there's nothing that was made that wasn't made by him. It includes us. John, why are you telling us this? Could it be that John is telling us this, that we know that, hey, Jesus is God, is the creator of the universe, which includes us. Is, is that screaming out at us? Is that coming out at us? Now, Jesus, we're going to realize, had a lot of I am statements. Right. I am the bread of life. I am the door. I am the light of the world. I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection. But that I am is significant. 
Because if we go back again to Exodus chapter 4, 3 or 4, it says, Moses, tell them, I am. Again, that is attributed to who? To God. So, John is sharing with us all of those traits that make us recognize that Jesus Christ is God. And we are to, we, we is going to present evidence upon evidence to support that Jesus Christ is God. And you can confidently stand and say, Jesus Christ is God. Now, all things were made through him. Question to us. I'm putting this out there because, so, Christ represented as the word able to divide the thoughts and intents. No audible answer necessary, just thought. Of course, if you choose to. How much of the word do we read as a practice? If it is Christ who represents the word that is able to discern our thoughts that is quick and powerful and sharp, how much of it do we read? John is giving us all this information about the power of Jesus Christ as a word. How much of it do we read? How much of it do we ingest? Something to think about. Now, If I, if I polled us, all of us are planning for tomorrow. Um, we have probably even way into next week, next month. The schedule we have says we're going up to March. But none of us and no one we know sustains this universe from amongst our human setting. Years ago, I don't know if you learned this, but I was told that the, the sun is some 93 million miles from the earth, and if it comes any closer, we're likely to have starvation, the crops will be burnt, and if it goes any further, we're likely to freeze, and it has been that one spot sustained for however long. That thought came to me when we were saying, Christ is the creator, the sustainer of this world. And John, John brings that point to, to rivet in our minds that, hey, know this, that this Jesus Christ, in human, that, uh, that has been here in human form, is that God that sustains. Now, let's, let's bring the world that John is in, is governed by the Old Testament system. And John is bold enough to say to us that, hey, or to say to his readers that the law came through Moses. Do you have that? But grace and mercy came through Jesus Christ. Is that significant? In what way? And remember now, we always keep at the forefront that John is trying to tell us the purpose of the book is for us to identify that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So if, if, if that is the purpose of the book, John, why are you telling us that the law came through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ? Why is that significant? Why? Any takers? Why, why is that 
Why would you need to tell us that, John? Anybody? Don't leave me here alone. Somebody. Um, that, that, that verse is taken, um, first of all, from verse 17. Yes. Um, for me, that was the old covenant. And Jesus is ushering in the new covenant that is applied for me, for, you know, for this side of heaven. You know, this does dispensation of time. So it's, tr it's relevant to all of us, everybody in this room. Okay. And that's what John wanted to let us know, that the old has been, that's one thing, mm -hmm. but now you've got something even better, something greater. Okay, can I, am I, am I, am I to add to that? Don't let me misrepresent you that. The creator is bringing in this new thing. Exactly. Okay, I, 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 I thought. Uh, well, I think when you look at like, on further, further references throughout the, the rest of the New Testament, see what Paul says about the fact that the law brought knowledge of, of our sin, of our iniquity, and now Jesus is coming to save us from those sins, those iniquities. So to for, for John to call out the fact that you know, Moses brought in the law, so let us know that our Moses brought in the law for us to be aware of our sins, to be a, for us to be aware of, of our iniquities, yeah. so now that Jesus can now come and save us from those iniquities. Okay. aspect I look at is um, uh, Moses is um, infallible where Christ is the perfect so uh, Moses could not have brought in uh, grace and truth so he handled what was physical what was the law that was the law and Christ handled what was spiritual which no man could have attained but him okay and just to compliment um, her comments um, Moses was like their, their the, the one of the great figures amongst them. So for them to, for him to even compare Jesus to that and um, was a bold statement of that time to say that he was even greater um, with what he was going to bring. Okay. Anybody else? No? Oh, we have. I'm I'm looking at verse 17 also where it says realize through Jesus Christ. So to I think also piggyback off what was already said. So Moses bringing this law where God was always intending to bring grace and truth. The truth of the law is this grace and truth that Christ realized. So when Christ came along where we go about beating each other and ourselves with the law, Christ tells us what we're really to do with that law, which is to love. And you know, when you go back also to the scripture of the two greatest or the greatest command, love God and love thy neighbor. Okay, all right, so I'm gonna take a bold step and say, I think all the comments are connected and some even similar. But the point that I think we're all saying is that up until this point, and when you have a chance, look at Luke 16, 16, the law and the prophets were until John. Up until this point, somebody said it that, I think Brittany, that Moses, the lawgiver, the emancipator, the, 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 the central figure that God has dispensed his authority through is what is in the forefront of the mind. John is saying, yes, accept Moses is great. But understand that at this juncture, at this point, grace and truth, what we really need, is going to come through Jesus Christ. So yeah, the law came through Moses, has kept us until this point. But what we need, mercy, grace, unmerited favor of God, is going to come through Jesus Christ. And, 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 and as we go a little further, you realize that there is sort of a graduating point with the Gospels when they start that up until this point, we're under a certain dispensation. Mm -hmm. 
we are now moving to another dispensation. And you need to graduate your mind from there to here. Come in, sister. We, as the people of God, need to recognize that there was a time before the blood of Christ cleansed us that we lived purely by that methodo method methodological, I hope I got it right, structure, law. We, we did, we worked based on punishment or reward. We just, we functioned. It is as grace, as we come to recognize God's unmerited favor in our lives, that some things just don't matter anymore. We don't know, you know, a lot of us, you might hear that, hey, get baptized, you don't want to go to hell. But as you progress in Christianity, you don't serve God because of that anymore. Because of God's grace and mercy towards you. It's that graduation point. Let me graduate to the sister and then to the brother. I, I think one of the things, yeah, thank you. <laughs> um, one of the things, when, when we study this, I think it, I always have to go back to the historical context and where this was and when this was. Okay. So it's important for us to remember that this this law was their culture, and this was also many, many years ago, and how do we then take that Jesus' grace and apply it to today? Yeah. yeah. I agree with you that the, 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 the Israelite law was intertwined <coughs> in the culture, in the governance. It was, it was what you knew. It's how you lived. And so you can imagine that this was sort of a, a radical concept to say, hey, we are shifting to a new place. Can you imagine when Jesus stands up in front of them and says, you have heard of old that if you, if, if, if you do this, but I say, really? What gives you that authority? But we're going to read some more about that when we talk about we are Abraham's seed. We're going to see some of that coming out. But I agree with you that it, we have to put that mindset in that place to say, hey, one environment that you have known all your life, and here is a new one that you must know and do or better understand to move to the next step. I agree with you, and I want to put it to you this way also. So the brother says it's more of a radical concept then that it, than it is today. And I want to add to that, while agreeing with him, that individually, coming to Christianity is a radical change. Many of us are not in families, organizations, or in groups that are Christians. Getting up on a snow, New Year's just went. We all know the tradition for New Year's is a New Year's Eve ball. It's a party. Mm -hmm. To say, hey, I will see you sometime in the day. I'm going to church. If you're not careful. Now some of us, you might be in the faith for a long while. It's, it's not even a challenge because most of your friends now understand you. Most of most, you are firm in your faith. But think about a young Christian, a young person, right. trying to make that radical change to say, hey, I am going to church. With all the voices, with all the years of disinformation, this way, right. to step out of that and say, no, I'm going to church. But I agree with you that Christianity then would have been more radical because the religion was the history it was the, 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 the politics. Everything was wrapped up into it. And we're going to see examples of that, for example, when we get to John chapter 9, where the man born blind and how the government, but we get to that. Um, just to piggyback on what you were saying, how the, the three dispensation of time, how the head of the household went from the patriarch to the Moses to the law. But each time, man failed God. Each time, um, you know, and that time that it was divide and conquer, it was the big over the little, and, and, and 
people were living for, it just seemed like for the day. And even Moses disappointed God. And so it just seemed like he had came to, God had come to a point, even with the, um, the flood and everything, come to the point where I'm going to send you an example. I'm going to send you a perfect example. And a time of grace, and, and the grace of God, of Jesus walking this earth, is that grace and mercy that you have a perfect example existing amongst us. So perfect. And that was, to me, the last straw. The only thing that God can, uh, can show, truly show what he wanted uh, for us without the politics, without man getting in the way. Um, and then that brings us to that, and it's your choice. And so the, so the law, you know, made you do it. But as God seeing him and Stacy has said, the love that, that Jesus showed is, showed that it's attainable mm -hmm. to, to comprehend what God has for all of us. And, and I think in a time of grace, we focus more on eternity, where, bef where you don't see people in the, uh, the Old Testament talk about eternal life as much as it is expressed in the New Testament, that it's more than just the present. It's beyond. Yeah. And again, that is, comes back to the religious setting that was there at the time. But you're right. Um, this idea of eternity is, is New Testament. Now, let's run through because we, talk, we, 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 we just spoke about now how John brings to us the, 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 the history, bridges the gap. And this is what is happening in chapter 1. John is bridging the gap between Old Testament and New. He's bridging the gap between John the Baptist and Jesus. He's graduating us. But he has started in demonstrating the deity, the sovereignty of God by giving us, by taking us from, by giving us context and taking us through. Now, Luke tells us in Acts, Acts chapter 3, verse 23, that Moses said God would raise up a prophet. Acts 3.23, like unto me, him. So as far back as Moses, Moses could have prophesied that, look, there is going to be a prophet raised up. He is the one. I want to suggest to us that M Moses is putting himself in the proper position to say, hey, I have done some work for God. But guess what? There is one coming. Now we talk about the Israelite nation and the intertwining of the history and the religion. They would have known this. They would have read this. They would have understood. And we're going to see some evidence of that as we go forward. But I wanted to bring that John in, 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 in telling us about the deity of, of, of Jesus Christ. That Christ was God. Is giving us enough, uh, giving his reader then and us enough information for us not to be to be stuck in trying to rationalize we know now based on what john is saying that hey there has to be a graduation sister stella you know as you're as you're talking i'm thinking about uh, the great i am when we think about david in psalms 23. Mm -hmm. And he was, he's door, he's the shepherd. And that's who brought us through, grace and truth. Because with the law, God knows we'd have more than, I know I'd have been dead. <laughs> and and uh, dead without grace, yes. We're going to see some more of that as we get to the I am statements. Yeah, I was just going to say, when I was um, sort of studying this, um, John, and, and the reason for it, um, one thing that, I feel like we're sort of in this, this well, some people are, it, well, the world is in this place right now that he was with the Israelites at the time where there's competing philosophies where there were even people saying that Jesus wasn't this real person and he was one of the people who walked with him and just his concept of believing to say that, you know, what you were talking about, that Moses was setting the way for him, that this was him. And there's a lot of competing philosophies that in his message he had to sort of say that this is the Messiah and he was real, I was with him, so believe. Um, so his message of believing was um, really powerful, but to, to also just keep in the historical context of the philosophies 
that were trying to pull the Israelites away to even say that Jesus wasn't even a person. Um, so it just gives a more appreciation to his uh, message of believing and how he's trying to set up that idea of that, the, the, the deity that you're, you're talking about, that he was real, he was the son of God. Yeah, and, and, and just to say that we have, I mean, I just read that, not just read it, and that there's a religion out there, it's called real, just, just as an example, R-A-E-L, and that says that we are created by a group of super space persons. Yeah. Is there? Check it out. But it, I'm just saying that we're not short on philosophies. And, you know, every, my good friends now tell me, oh, people I know who would say Jesus Christ would know, are now telling me, oh, the universe. I said, okay. Yeah. So we're not short on yeah. philosophies. Mm -hmm. All right. Now, Let's pop through. So, again, hold up in front of you. John is trying to tell us that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He's presenting the evidence in the case. So that's why we are looking at the facts in the case to see, do they add up? Do they give us the same conclusion? Now, John the Baptist, okay, yeah, he says, he's walking with his apostles, and he says, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Now, if the disciples of John didn't know what this phrase mean, he would just be speaking in the ear. But the fact that when he says it, behold the Lamb of God, those disciples could then begin to follow Jesus Christ. That Jesus says to them, why are you following me? What you want? Where are you staying? He says, come and see. But why would John make a simple statement, behold the Lamb of God, and it has such profound impact on you that you decide, remember now, remember now, let's bring back to one of the reasons John the Baptist died was because at his feast, he made a promise. But one of the reasons it troubled him to kill John the Baptist is because he feared him, because the people revered John as a prophet. So that is what's happening in the culture of the day. But these guys, these apostles, Andrew being one of them, decided to leave this great prophet, John the Baptist, and follow Jesus simply because John says, Behold the Lamb of God. Shouldn't Andrew say, oh, that's a good statement. It had profound impact. Here is the Christ. Here is God's sacrifice. Here is what God has pro provided for the atonement of sin. That is why Andrew left, and Andrew went and found his brother and said what? We have found him. Andrew? found him who? Him who? You see, John the Baptist would have given them enough information, plus their history and religion would have given them enough information that they knew. Moses the great prophet says, and he will raise up a prophet like unto me. Listen to him. Um, as we as they went through the different places, God is coming. There's going to come a time when the Messiah, the anointed one, will come. We just need to be looking for him. Follow the signs. Follow the evidence. I'm going to just share some news with us. We are to be watching the signs. Matthew tells us nobody knows when. But we ought to be watching the signs. Yeah. But we know the advent of Christ. Yeah. Hey, they knew. That is why Andrew could say, we have found him. I'm not going to say anything else because, mm. so it has to be very quick. So yeah. give it to me. I just wanted to, because you was tied, as, as they tied the threads, like you had to have your first sacrifice, even back in the Old Testament. You had to um, give your best sacrifice. Um, 
And so that metaphor and just to tie in the language, using the lamb, using God, uh, Jesus as the metaphor of the lamb, all the lambs are going to be sacrificed. They are, have been sacrificed. And they are the best, you know, have presented as the best. Yep. And for the atonement of sins, blemish. it's been back from the patriarch time. You know, so they knew, but they didn't know. And then, like, it, and people don't recognize deity until death. Like, no one really recognized Jesus, who he was, until death. And the same, and like, they didn't really believe that that was him until he, you know, some of them, until he died. And it's the same men, um, m mentality man still has today. People don't recognize people until they're dead. And then they want to name signs and streets and buildings and stuff. It's the same type of mentality that you don't recognize something until it's gone. I agree with you that a great majority of us seem not to recognize a value until we have lost it or until we have a chance to put it all together and realize, whoa, we have, we have seen greatness. Mm -hmm. I am hoping that our minds are all over the place. I'm really hoping. Really hoping that we are not even sure where we are mentally. Really hoping. I'm really hoping that's where we are. Because that way, that way we would have now gone back to the beginning as John would have us to. And now we can begin to dissect the book and build it back up. I am deliberately not reading the chapters because we just don't have the time. So it means it's a partnership. I'm going to beg you to read the chapters and so we can <coughs> get into them as we come. But one of the things is that we should pull from this is that Jesus is God. Chapter 1, verse 1. 2, Jesus is the creator of the world and its contents. We need to be cementing some of these things. Jesus provides access to the grace and mercy of God. That we need to hold on to. And of course, we can find and know Jesus. It was possible then, it's possible now. There is enough evidence for us to find and know Jesus collectively and personally. With that said, let's dive into chapters 2 and 3. And we begin all over next week. What we have in chapter one, you can't leave it. So you have to bring it next week so that we build on it, so that when we get to the choosing of the apostles, as we get down to Jesus Christ and his first miracle, you see how we bring the two in. So please don't leave chapter one next week. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for this session. We thank you for the revelation you have left us. We thank you, O oh God, for how John has made the decision to write to us and to share with all mankind the deity, the power, the authority of Jesus Christ. So, O oh God, let us recognize that all we have, who we are, is made possible because Jesus Christ was considerate of us. Pray, Father, that you will help us to not to treat Christ as a common thing, but to always, O oh God, look to him who is the author and finisher of our faith. Forgive us, be with us as we transition to the next setting of worship. We pray through Christ's name, amen.